Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar. My name is Leah Swanberg. I am the founder of Egg Helpers. I'm also a several time donor, both known and anonymously. And today it is my absolute pleasure to open a conversation that uh, is not only necessary, but also is going to give, I hope, all of you uh, time to think and reflect either about your own personal journey to parenthood, about your journey to becoming an egg donor or continuing as an egg donor. Um, as well, I know we have some industry partners on this webinar listening, and we are just truly excited uh, to begin what we hope is a candid conversation with amazing people who have so much to share, uh, both professionally and personally. Uh, I'd like to start by saying that if you are watching this webinar and you are a parent of a donor-conceived um, child, adult person, um, you know, there is going to be information, there are resources that are gonna be dropped into the chat for you. If you are maybe wondering how you're gonna have this conversation um, about them being donor conceived, if you're gonna have that conversation and what the research says around having that conversation. If you're a donor and you are, um, you know, getting ready to participate in, in another donation and, your previous donation was anonymous and you know you're you're curious about what would look different as a known donor um and, and if you're an industry partner if you work at a fertility clinic and and you wondered why the parents don't meet the donor or vice versa um we hope to cover all of that for you today and so you know as i said i i own an egg donor agency i've also been a donor um, my two oldest children um, are also donors, and my third daughter of five um, is going to be donating this spring. And it is a part of our family um, to give back in this way. And, and for myself, having been an anonymous donor and a known donor, it's really shaped and formed the way in which we've grown egg helpers. And as we learn more, as we um, delve into more research that shifts and changes. And I, I look at it similarly to how adoption has shifted and changed in that 30 years ago, 40 years ago, uh, an open adoption likely wasn't uh, a conversation. And now, um, and now we know that, you know, open adoptions really are the way to go so that children have and people have, um, whether it's medical information that, that they know, you know, and, and so we're going to talk about all of those things today. And so what I want to discuss from a agency perspective is what is known, what is anonymous, what is open ID, um, there are many ways to donate. There are many ways to receive eggs um, as parents or people on their way to parenthood. And so when people ask us or when, when people ask about that, it is as known as your comfort level or as anonymous as your comfort level. Uh, there are a few rules around that. If you're going to have a known donation, it needs to be known both ways. So as a donor, you would know the intended parents. As a donor, the intended parents would know you. Or intended parents, you would know your donor and she would know you. And so really thinking about that, what does that mean? Um, would you be comfortable with open ID, which means when the child reaches the age of majority, um, that they would be able to find you? So leaving the parents to tell that child um, everything or nothing um, along the way? Or would it mean that you would want to be known and meet the people before they become parents, develop a relationship and have your children potentially know their children and develop that, um, that bond 
and that connection through the entire process. And while some people are comfortable with when my child is age of majority, they, they could find this person, while other people um, say right from the beginning, I would love to know this woman who is participating in our family building journey. I would love to um, to meet her or attend the retrieval or have her have updates about our child. Um, again, it really is personal, but I think it's important. And anything that's important, we suggest you unpack with someone. And so my suggestion always is unpacking that with the counselor or therapist at your fertility clinic. It is best practice that your clinic offers this service free of charge to not only intended parents becoming parents, but to egg donors who are helping people become parents. Because while an intended parent may see known as open ID, a donor may consider known, I know you, we communicate, I participate in your life. And so figuring out what that looks like, because for me, it is not so much about what is better. It is about what is best for you and what is best for your child. And we're going to hear about the research from our other um, guests on our webinar today. And I think it's going to be really clear what the research says, but I'm going to leave that to them um, because they will have far more information on that. Um, but what I do know is that as an agency, we tell people um, that an anonymous donation is just that. It's closed. You have a donor's ID number. Um, in your legal contract, you may have information around um, gender and dates of birth of future children that you have or your donor has, um, that that would be provided through the lawyer, the agency, or the clinic. Um, or it may be that um, you've purchased eggs from an egg bank, and that would likely be anonymous as well. And how in the future, with an anonymous donation, could you find this person? And there's resources, there's information about, well, you may know this person by um, registering for the sibling donor registry. You may be able to find this person through contacting your lawyer and saying, hey, made a mistake. I actually want to know this person. So again, it really is, the, the information you're going to hear is really about where you are in your journey. If you have conceived, if you have a surrogate who has conceived, if you are, um, you know, you have a five-year-old child, a 10-year-old child, there are resources to help along the way to have that conversation that, you know, I can only imagine is tricky to bridge. And I want to, um, you know, I'm going to be asking questions of, of our panelists, but I'd love for you to as well put your questions into the chat so that these great people can answer them as well. I do want to leave you with this, though. Um, I, it is a small world. And while we often believe anonymity exists, um, as we know with 23andMe and with other uh, DNA testing that is so commonplace, and you can purchase 23andMe on Amazon for $100, you know, we are finding each other. We are finding our genetic family, our genetic people. Um, and so 20, do I want to say 20 years ago? You know, time really just, yeah, probably 20. Uh, no, 15 years ago, I was in a grocery store in Toronto. I lived on Vancouver Island at the time. I am on Vancouver Island now. I was in a grocery store and there was a woman in front of me with her child in a stroller. And I this child reached behind and grabbed my hand. And I looked at this kid and I thought, hmm, this kid looks like my kid. That's sort of funny. And I looked at this woman in front of me and she looked like me, but probably 10 years older. And she turned around and she said, are you donor LP 0124? And, or she said, do I know you? And I said, no, I don't think so. I don't live here. And she said, are you donor, you know, such and such. And you know, I was very shocked and it was a chance meeting. She recognized me and it had been an anonymous donation. 
and it became known in that moment. Um, and, you know, we stayed in touch for some time. We're, we're not really in touch now, but she has my details. And for me as a donor, it was scary and exciting in that split second. But knowing that this woman had her child perfectly bundled up in this red, it was funny, I remember this red suit, red snowsuit, and that this child looked healthy and beautiful and wonderful was everything. Um, as a mom of five, knowing that I helped this woman who I came to find out was a single mom by choice, and you know, she was so grateful and she was such a lovely person and a lovely mom. Um, it was really beautiful. And, and I share that because that is where my passion comes from in terms of really supporting known donation and supporting um, our children. Um, you know, for myself, my children knowing that there are people out there that are genetically connected to them. So not only does a known donation you know, talk about these people and their children, but it also is about, for me anyways, my children and what that means for them. My youngest is five, my oldest is 30, and I've got, you know, three more in between there. And for us to have that conversation around giving people an opportunity to have what we have as a family has just been so beautiful um and it's it's become a part of our family as as i said my first two children have donated and, and their children resulted that they know that i know that's amazing they're the cutest kids um and you know of course look like us because we have strong genes um and it's everything it's everything to watch people become parents and for me to be able to show up in a way um knowing that I gave this gift based on the fact that I have amazing children and I could not imagine not sharing that. And so as you hear from our experts, um, you know, I hope that you are thinking about and gathering questions and, you know, that, that this is settling in for you because I, I feel like there aren't these webinars often that talk about, um, you know, anonymous versus known and 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 what we're looking at there. So um, I will bring Melissa on. Hey, Melissa. Hello. Um, so I connected with Melissa over the holidays um, when she beautifully jumped down my throat on a post I made <laughs> on Egg Helpers about, do you wanna be an egg donor? Do this, do that, this, that. And she posted below, well, what about this? And what about that? And I was like, well played, Melissa, you got my attention. We need to talk. <laughs> and it opened this conversation for me around the almost taboo subject. And for me as a woman, um, Jordan, do we have the new private chat or the new chat? So if people have questions for Melissa, we'll be able to see them. Um, that would be great. Um, but this taboo subject, because, you know, it's easy for me as someone who's been a donor and is a woman and is a feminist and is, you know, a mom and a surrogate and all the things to fall into this trap of, you know, some guy in a dark room at a clinic. And it, as an egg donor, it's different, you know, and it, and it feels different, but I don't know because I'm not donor conceived. I don't know um, anything other than I as an agency owner have a responsibility to people that I help. And the people that I'm responsible to are not just the parents who receive mm -hmm. a profile of a donor, who go to a fertility clinic that I've recommended and speak to a lawyer and speak to a therapist. I have an overarching responsibility to children that result from the people I help and best practices are so important. And, you know, I'm, I'm learning as I go um, and over Christmas learned really a lot. And so I want to introduce Melissa 
Melissa is going to introduce herself and hopefully share some of her story and, and what she does. Um, and Jordan, I still don't see, maybe I'm in the wrong spot. Should I be in comments? Yes, there I am. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so Melissa, yeah, fill us in. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and obviously there's so much that we could talk about and thank you for uh, just being ready to listen and ask questions even after <laughs> I try to be uh, uh, direct in my Instagram comments, but I also want to be gracious too. And so there's that fine line. So thanks for um, listening and letting that open up a conversation where we could both um, ask questions and learn from each other. Um, so I am part of uh, a group around the world and in the U.S. called Late Discovery Donor Conceived Person because I come from the 70s, 80s, 90s era of something that you referenced um, matches adoption. It's just that we're a little further behind in the donor conceived world. And that is that people were told not to tell their children um, that they were donor conceived. And that was what they thought at the time was the best practice. And so there are many- That still happens, by the way. Yes. Um, now, now it's for, uh, I think it's a little harder to say that, that people didn't know it was a good idea. Um, but, uh, because it's more common to recommend it, but that doesn't mean everybody is doing it, which we can talk about, um, too, but either way, my parents had no intention or, a, I guess, even awareness of that process of telling. Um, so I did not know. I lost my father when I was 15. So um, I spent my whole adult life um, looking for signs of him and connections to him in myself and in my three kids. So I did a lot of... Um, reaching and grasping and looking for signs of him. And so when I found out as an adult that I was conceived through a sperm donor, it was a second loss for me because I, I lost connections that I thought linked me to my dad. Um, it didn't change that he was my dad. That will always be the case, but it, it was a grieving process for sure. Through that process, of course, thankfully, I had uh, counseling and support from friends, but I also noticed that there was a gap in resources for donor-conceived adults. Partially, that gap was just nobody knows how many donor-conceived people there are. Um, people, I didn't even know that I was what's called donor-conceived. For the first year that I was donor-conceived, I only knew sperm donor baby. I didn't know what to call myself even though I wasn't obviously a baby, um, that terminology wasn't given to me by anybody that I asked because mental health professionals didn't know. My doctor didn't know. He just shared a story with me about how he was asked to donate in his residency. And he said, thank God I didn't because <laughs> look, and I thought this isn't really helpful right now. <laughs> um, I need to know what to do. Uh, and you being glad you didn't donate. I mean, he was very kind. He was just thinking off the top of his head because he had no training in how to handle uh, working with a donor conceived person who didn't have their medical history. So I discovered that it was like the party trick that I didn't want to have. Every time I talked about it, it was very novel to everybody that I talked to and fascinating. They would mention that it sounded like a lifetime movie or it sounded like something from a talk show, which gave it attention, but not resources. It just made it something that I could talk about, but I was still the one that had the burden of educating, of finding resources, of advocating, of correcting and clarifying all while I didn't know what I was doing. So and I just want to stop on that point. And I just mm -hmm. want to say to everyone that's listening, it is not your responsibility as a donor, as an intended parent, as a parent, to provide emotional labor to this and, and to educate the world while it's lovely. And, and, I, and I think we're doing that right now. Um, I want to give you permission to tell people to kindly, you know, go their way on it. And that 
you know, when we're asking people to show up for us and to support us, you know, that, that, that hopefully after this conversation um, and hearing Melissa's story and hearing Jan and Cindy, you, you'll have maybe some language around it, but you know, it's, it, you know, Melissa, I'm sure you have given, well, I know you have given all the labor, all the emotional time and, you know, educating the world on this, but you know, for, for our viewers, people on this, I want you to know, like, this is, this is your story. And, you know, we, we really honor whatever way you manage that. Yeah. And I think um, the tricky part is to advance the awareness. And this, we know this about a lot of other marginalized communities and a lot of people who, uh, groups of people who don't have resources. At some point, there has to be a shift that people work together to make changes and to validate the experience. Um, and so it takes people working together to go in the same direction to make a change. And I think that thankfully, um, as donor conceived people are not babies and are not children and are growing up, there's a wide variety of experiences, but sharing those experiences and making sure that we share them with people who can make changes is really a proactive way to make something out of um, the challenge. And so for me, it was creating support resources for donor conceived people so that people didn't have to do the work from scratch all over again. So um, I started peer support groups for donor conceived adults and started looking at where are donor conceived people spending a lot of time, energy, and effort, and how can we keep them from having to start from scratch every time. So um, there are a lot of resources that I still need to build. Um, things that we know donor conceived people need. We need um, tools to talk to our, med our healthcare professionals. We need tools to talk to our mental health professionals. We need resources to find our genetic information and our health history and our risks. We need ways to connect with um, siblings as adults that we have found on 23andMe and we're not, you know, sure of what that relationship will look like. So there's a lot of resources that we want to build, but the main piece right now has been connecting people in these virtual peer support groups because it's so powerful to meet other people who are navigating the same journey. And we know that because peer support groups are they're helpful in so many other places, whether it's connecting over um, both having a diagnosis or have, having um, a challenge that they're working through together. So thankfully the peer support group model is um, tried and true. And so that's what we're using to help donor conceived people. And it, it really reduces the stigma around donor conceived topics um, to be able to connect in that way. So it's been really wonderful and um, we still have a lot of work to do, but it's been really helpful for donor conceived people to have that resource. Um, through that, even though we don't have a lot of data, um, there are not enough studies yet about donor conceived people, um, but we do have some good qualitative data coming from it and also some good questions to ask when we do start to measure things more. Um, but that requires donor conceived people knowing that they're donor conceived. <laughs> so we do have a challenge there for sure. Um, every day though, people are finding out on 23andMe and Ancestry and, and parents are starting to share the stories sometimes too, just on their own realizing, okay, I didn't tell up until this point, but it's time to, to share that information, even though it's going to be a challenge possibly. So and in the comments um, for the people watching, there are books um, and, and resources that Melissa suggests. I was just texted a, um, a question for you, Melissa. Um, yeah. I, my, my concern often is, and, and we know this, is that a lot of times people will not want to ask questions on a public forum because they're yeah. unsure what that answer may look like. And so um, the question, Sorry, just I'm just trying to it's okay. like short story it. It's kind of a long one. Um, okay. Um, the question is: uh, This woman is talking about how she, um, her child is donor conceived, 
she didn't tell her um, obstetrician, her child is now two, she didn't tell her child's doctor, she hasn't told anyone. Mm-hmm. Um, and now she's wondering about, and, and it was an anonymous donation, it doesn't say if it was sperm or egg, I don't think it matters. Um, but she is wondering if there are any um, recommendations for sort of, sort of how to go back to people and tell them after she's sort of created this story around her child's conception. Um, that's a great question. And I would say it's really wonderful that she's asking it now at two years old um, because it's better than waiting longer. And it, wherever a parent is who's listening right now, now is a good time to start, even if we can't rewind and go backwards. Um, but now is a good time to start. So um, I would start with the people who are most safe to her um, and also who are going to be most involved in the child's life because um, that's that's who they're going to talk with about questions surrounding it. And so um, whoever she feels the most safe with, I think would be a good place to start who might know and be understanding about her conception story. And also the people who are going to field the questions about um, from the child, um, do I have a biological father or do I have a dad? That's how the question usually starts. Do I have a dad or do I have a father? Um, If there isn't one in the picture, that question will come up most likely and can even at school. Um, I would start also with a healthcare professional just because um, even as a child, there can be health concerns or uh, risk factors that may be important to know. Um, And some of this even has links with ancestry, Um, knowing that your child is 50% Jewish, for example, um, may cause different screenings to take place or the need to rule out certain things if there should be some symptoms. So I would start for sure with the pediatrician um, and then start with the close closest circle and start with the trusted people first. And some of it can be Um, organic as things come up. It doesn't have to be everybody at the same time. You know, it can be starting and um, pacing yourself for that conversation too. So I think the other piece is as you're having those conversations, um, it could be really helpful to have some support from a mental health professional or um, people that you have shared the information with to let them know that you're going to be starting this process so that you have support, support for yourself. Excellent. Excellent. And my last question for you. um, What is the one common piece that donor conceived people would have loved to, um, I guess the the question is kind of long, so I'm trying to paraphrase so that it makes sense. what is one thing that you believe would make lives easier for donor conceived people from a fertility clinic perspective? Whew. I can't pick one. I'll just be honest, <laughs> but I will, I will try. So, um, I'm going to pick three just because I wouldn't do it sure. just if I didn't, um, having access to, health history, family medical health history is a human right. Yeah. It shouldn't be optional. So it's a necessity. Um, And then I would say right in there having, oh, this is hard having access to, so I'm going to leave things out just because it's hard to narrow it down here. Right. Yeah. yeah. um, Having access to know who your genetic or biological parent is and who the siblings are is really important. It may not be important to every single donor conceived person. They may at some point say, I don't need to do anything with that information, but the ability to make the choice of whether or not the information is valuable to them, I believe is a right that they should have. There are people who are donor conceived who find out and don't want to do anything with that information. They choose not to look 
And it's very similar in adoption. People might find out that they're adopt or they know they're adopted. They've grown up with this awareness and they decide they don't want to connect to the parents, um, whether we call them a birth parent or a biological parent, they decide that they don't want a relationship or they don't want to connect. And that's a choice that they are able to make. They can make that choice because they're aware that they're adopted. Um, and ideally would know who the biological parent is. So there are people who are donor conceived who find the sibling as an, find some siblings as an adult and really grieve that they didn't have the chance to know along the way. And this is especially true where there's a mix of heterosexual couples, same-sex parents, and um, same-sex couples. I think I might've mixed that up. Same-sex couples, heterosexual couples, and single parents by choice. Because there are times when there's a sibling group of half siblings that they all know each other and they've known since early on because their parents were aware of who the other donor families were. And then there's a family where the child doesn't know and they're not told until they're adults. And there's this feeling of these 15 have been together all along the way, been gathering once a year, the parents have been in contact. And then, oh, we were waiting for you. We knew you were out there somewhere as the, the ones that weren't told. And so they've missed out on this ability to know what their, who their siblings are, what's going on in their life, and they feel like they've arrived late on the scene, which is really sad. Um, so. Well, thank you. And, and we are in Canada, or I am, Jan is Cindy, the, the other two presenters, we are, we are on it and we are really wanting to raise awareness so that people who, um, you know, are participating as donors, um, you know, people who are, you know, becoming parents through this beautiful gift of donation, um, really are having that option and that opportunity to, to develop the conversation. So um, if you're watching, Melissa's information is in the chat there. She has a, a amazing um, support group and she's also offered up some great books um, and other information. So please, uh, Melissa, I'm going to bring Jan on, but Stay tuned because we're all going to come on at the end. If there's any further questions, thank you, Melissa. It's great to yeah, chat again. Thank you. Well, Miss Silverman, hello. I learned something this week that Jan has been working at this in this field for 30 years. Um, as a an agency owner, we she is our our expert that we talk to when things are beautiful and wonderful and also when things are mess messy and hard. And um, Jan and I have talked often about the difference between privacy and secrecy. We've talked often about best practices at clinics. And this week alone, uh, Jan and I spearheaded a project at Canada's largest fertility clinic to ensure that donors have and intended parents who are building their families through donation have counseling at the time of this decision, at the time the donor starts medication, once the retrieval has happened, if a complication arises, if there are no eggs, if there are no embryos, if there are eggs, if there are embryos, that counseling is going to be available. And before Jan starts, I want to tell you who are watching, if you are a clinic and you are watching this, this is what you need to do. This is the right thing to do. If you're a donor, access it. Tell your clinic this is something you want. If it is, um, feelings come up for us. I know for myself as a donor, from donation one to donation five, very different feelings arose for me. And having someone to unpack that with as a donor would have been everything. Um, if you are intended parents watching this or um, people who have a child um, through uh, donor conception and you want to unpack this, you know, we're going to give you information so you can connect with Jan. Um, she is just the top, top, top. Um, so Jan, I would love for you to share, you know, whatever you want to share about 30 years in this. Um, you know, I, I will say, I, I also learned today that in 1993 was the first known donor agreement, egg donor, sister to sister. Um, but I know that egg donation has been going on. Um, probably longer than that. Um, but Jan, if you want to share um, 
I always <laughs> want to share. Don't worry. So first yes. of all, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this oh so important seminar. And I will say that it is something that counselors have seen the need for for probably the 30 years that I have been in this. And I know that Melissa just very accurately talked about it not being open all those years ago. But trust me, it was counselors saying this has to happen because we have always recognized the importance for honesty and openness where possible. So let me just begin for two seconds by saying that I am an infertile woman. Um, I made my family through adoption back in my time, and I will not reveal my age anymore, but back in my time, um, all adoptions were closed adoptions, which is similar but not the same thing to closed donations. And I just bring this to your attention because one of the most important things that I think often is ignored is that there is a transition that happens for heterosexual couples as they move towards recognizing that they are not going to be able to use their own eggs and that they are going to indeed, if they choose to make a family, have to do it through egg donation. And I think that is this the same Jan with sperm donation? Like, would you equate this conversation Absolutely. with egg sperm? Everybody, okay. Absolutely. I think, and the reason I um, outlay uh, heterosexual couples because I think for our wonderful same-sex couples, they always knew they were going to need an egg donor of some sort. They knew they did not have eggs. So for them, the feeling is often one of such joy and elation that wonderful donors exist out there. But for heterosexual couples, there is that transition period that has to take place initially. They have to deal with their own feelings of what has just happened. And I don't think that that's a slam dunk. And you're gonna hear me say again and again how important it is to work that through with a counselor because the impacts on your sense of yourself, I'm a failure, I can't do this, I've always taken care, how could this happen to me? So many implications as well as the impact on a relationship. Often a partner, a male partner may say, no, so we'll use a donor. And yet for the woman, she still has to give up that dream of having a child that is genetically linked to her. And sometimes it takes time. And I think that that transition point is not easy, takes a little processing, takes time. And I think that it impacts on some of the early attitudes about not talking about it and why we don't take, why we don't talk about it quicker and easier and why it's been such a journey. And oh my God, I am so thrilled to hear about Melissa and the work she is doing. And we need more and more and more and more of this happening. But I think acknowledge the loss of not having a genetically linked child to yourself. And you have to be able to acknowledge that because as much as people told me, oh, you got your babies as newborns, it's the same thing. It's not the same thing. And please acknowledge the difference. And it is the same thing when we're working with a donor. Acknowledge that there has been the involvement of this wonderful person that has helped to make my dream come true. So I just wanted to address that first of all as a really, really important task. And then I want to move as we make that transition. And I want to put forth the question of why did people and why do people not tell? Like why after 30, 33, four years of egg donation more, why are people still so reluctant? to share that. And, um, you know, when asked sometimes, and I'm going to be blunt because age gives you the ability to be blunt and say whatever you want. And for some people, they don't need age. They're just blunt and say whatever they want anyway. Um, 
often it was the doctor saying, no one will ever know. You'll look pregnant. Nobody will know. You don't have to say, don't have to tell anybody. <laughs> but I think we have to question that. Why did people and why are people still reluctant not to tell? And I'm going to, again, go back to that infertility piece because infertility is about shame. It's about anger. It's about disappointment. And it's about not feeling legitimized as a mother. Was the universe telling me that I was never meant to be a mother? That's why my eggs didn't work or my sperm. Was the universe telling me this? So before... I can move into accepting somebody else who is able to provide eggs for me. I have to make that transition that being a mother is not just about eggs. And although that sounds easy, it's not easy. And there you have this beautiful, wonderful donor who can provide all the eggs that I can't provide. And my status and my understanding of myself as a real mother isn't quite there yet. And I believe that that enters into some of that challenge. And I think when we make it okay to say, yes, that is hard. Yes, there's work that you had to do. Yes, you have to understand that parenting is more than just an egg or a sperm or a uterus, then maybe we can move forward and legitimize ourselves, ourselves as an infertile per population, as a parent. And I think, and I want to add, and I think the language is always an important piece in that because we have to talk about how we use language. You know, earlier someone talked about um, biological uh, donors as the biological parents. And, you know, there's different views and different thoughts about are you the parent? Are you the donor? But sometimes that can be a restrictive point and something that has to be talked about. There's no one right answer about it. Um, but I think you know, use language. Start initially by thinking of it as a donor. Start by referring it and thinking of the person as the wonderful woman that was there to help me make, or the wonderful man for sperm. I'm just egg donors oriented right now. Um, but oh, this is the wonderful person, but sometimes sharing status and thinking of them as the parent can also go, whoa, well, if they're the parent, then what am I? And, and I, I think, think different that, people have different language. 100%. You know, for the donor conceived person, it may be, you know, the parent, 100%. genetic parent. And for the intended parent, it may be the donor. And I think really getting comfortable with whatever language suits you and, and honors your personal experience, you know, and as a donor, you know, I, I taught, was talking to my kids, my five and seven year old on the way to school today. And I said, yeah, I'm doing this webinar about eggs. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like chickens, you know, and, and they're, you know, funny. And, you know, I think at every age or every possible scenario and, and who you are as participating in this, the, the language is, is yours, you know, a hundred percent and to be decided on together. And that is part of what we want to include the donor in that. So I want to just address, because I know we have other speakers to talk, to get on as well. But I want to address this whole sense of, um, do we owe the child this knowledge? Hmm. You know? And I am going to say that I believe we owe children the knowledge from where they came from. Um, but I will say that in some circumstances, I don't believe that we owe anybody, we don't owe everybody an explanation. And that is where the difference in secrecy and privacy also comes in. Because I do think that we have to have a sensitivity. For some people, there are cultural issues. I have spoken to a number of people from other countries 
that will say their fear is enormous, that if it is known, the child will not be accepted by their community. Now, part of me wants to say, but if we start making it known, then it can happen and then it can. That's my living in an ideal world. I don't inhabit other, uh, I don't inhabit every diverse culture. And I have to be respectful of where other people are coming from. So we also can have regional diversity, even within Canada. You know, it's great to be in a city and it's great to have and it's great to have. But it's that sense if you are the only person that you feel like an other. And that can be challenging. That doesn't mean we don't talk, but I'm just I'm just saying that we have to respect our cultural um, cultural and regional diversity. Um, so what I want to add before you cut me off. No, I have questions for you. I'm getting questions for you. So I just keep looking going, oh my gosh, okay, the questions are adding okay. up. Okay, because I just want to say that this is, again, when you are going through the donor process and everyone involved in the process must be seen by a counselor. The clinics all make that mandatory. So that means all the donors and the recipients are to be seen. And I was speaking to some IPs, intended parents the other day, who so said, yeah, yeah, we met with a, do a counselor, but but it was just like, just met, just, sorry. He... Okay, sorry, I apologize. But it was, um, um, oh, it was cursory. We, nothing was covered. And I thought, take your session seriously. And I'm going to urge for all the donors and for all the intended parents, take your session seriously. There is important information that should be covered. And in addition to the mental health statuses and all those sorts of things, when I speak to intended parents, <laughs> I talk a lot about how do we talk to children and ask your counselors for information and support and help around that. You know, I always will talk about that we start talking at them early, 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 early. We hear all the time, at what age do I start presenting it? And I'm always saying, from the start, I love the suggestion, and I had it from an old council years ago. I love the suggestion that when you bring your baby home for the first time, tell the baby everything. Tell that newborn baby everything. Tell them about how you met. Tell them about how hard you tried to make a baby. Now, don't be surprised if the baby falls asleep while you're talking and doesn't really respond too much but you're getting the words out for the first time because getting the words out is often such a chat. How do I say it? Well, practice while they're young. Practice by saying mommy and daddy knew how much they wanted you. And we went to see the doctor and the doctor said, I'm going to help you to help your dream. And Why on the other you? side of that, um, Jan, I really want to talk about it from a donor perspective and, and sharing, like it, it, it makes me teary to think about it and having the ability to share that with my kids. Um, and for me being in this industry and working in this field and, you know, all the things, um, it's just a part of, you know, my daughter became the age when she could donate and she said, I'm ready to be a donor. It's just what we do. And so it, I know my situation is different, but for those of you who are wondering as donors, like, how would I tell my kids? Because it is important. It is vital for donor conceived people to know. Absolutely. It is vital. And I, and I'm not going to say it's vital. I'm going to say it's important. It's, I'm going to say almost imperative, which is, I feel like vital light for my children to know that there are people out there in this world, living with their parents, living their best life, but that are connected to us genetically so that there isn't a knock on the door that may surprise or turn up my apple cart or that my spouse or partner knows that this is something that I was a part of for me that I was very proud of. But if I wasn't, if my donations maybe didn't have support to unpack and, you know, all of those pieces, 
because I'm going to challenge you, Jan, an hour with a counselor to talk about giving away, you know, the what some people feel is giving away a child. I never felt that way. I, I'm so grateful to, to my donation processes. But I'm telling you, if you're a donor, you want to talk to your clinic about the fact that you may need three, four, five counseling sessions and that they put you in this, you know, they they welcomed you in when they were collecting your eggs, but where were they after when you needed support? And I said I wasn't getting on a tangent, yet here I am. Um, for donors and our children, that our children should have the opportunity to understand and know that we were a part of something greater than just our nuclear family that's right here. And, and so challenge your clinic, you know, challenge them. And if you, if you are at the clinic, I mean, I'm just going to say create fertility where Jan is a part of, you know, we, you know, strong armed a doctor this week and we made it possible that donors are going to get to talk to a counselor four or five, six times. That's important. We need that. And intended parents need that. And, and having that conversation, you know, for, for me with my kids, like, you know, I was a donor and there's, you know, these kids and, you know, like, it's cool. It's, I love it. You know, it's, it's my pleasure to have that conversation, but if you're a donor and you do want to start having that conversation with your children, um, because yeah, they could do 23 and me and start collecting people along the way, you know, uh, and, and if you're parents and, and you're wanting to talk to, you know, you did an anonymous donation and you're wanting to meet your donor, contact the agency, contact the clinic, contact the lawyer, see if it's possible. Um, because as a donor who has been contacted way late, I think it's important. Um, okay. Sorry. We have a question. Oh, Oh, hey, Nikki, um, U.S. Agency Professional, recommending a book, Let's Talk About Egg Donation. Um, oh, by Carol Lieber-Wilkins and Marna Gatlin for IPs who will be, um, I'm taking out the word using, Nikki, although I know you didn't mean it in the way it triggers me, but, you know, I'm triggerable, um, who will be working with a donor uh, to begin and expand their family. So, um, yes, thank you for that. Can thank you for I that. I just said that Carol... Um, is the second recipient of an egg do of an anonymous egg do of an egg donor. She is she brings she was there at the beginning when don't ask how her donation her, hearing her story is probably one of the most awesome stories I've ever heard of an egg donor recipient. It's amazing. Well, as, she we, amazing. as we grow this community, we hope to have her on. I would that. let's bring her in. She is a uh -huh. wonderful woman. Amazing. Great. Thank you, Nikki, for, for that suggestion. And I'm really glad you're on here because I'm hoping that we are starting conversations and I know you're like there. Um, oh, Nikki, I love that. <laughs> um, yeah. So thank you, Jan. You're amazing. Um, I'm being told by Jordan, we're done. I need to bring oh. Cindy on now. Um, okay. Thank you again. For the Andrew, one last, one last quick sentence. One last quick sentence is don't be afraid of this. Embrace this. This is a miracle in the happening and it's a miracle all the way around. And I think nothing is wrong with celebrating. Not only is it not wrong, celebrate. I always tell last thing, five things. You talk about it openly, honestly, regularly. You talk about it joyously and you never apologize for needing help. You embraced that it was there and there were people there to help you. Thank you, Okay, Jan. on to Cindy. Cindy, you're up. Hello, everyone. Wow. Yay. Oh, I'm introducing you. So just <laughs> hold your hold your tongue there. Um, Nikki, I would love for you, uh, sorry, before Cindy, before I introduce Cindy, Nikki, I would love for you to post your agency because I know we have people on here that are going to you know, yeah. look for an agency in the U.S. And I love to pump up whoever I can. You know, we're collaborators here. Um, so please post the link to your agency. I would love to. Um, okay. Cindy is a fertility lawyer, uh, dear friend. Um, we put our boxing gloves on every once in a while when she calls me about a client, and I love that. Um, she keeps 
uh, me on my toes when we talk about egg donation, when we talk about surrogacy, um, when we talk about family building. Um, and she punched me in the face a few years ago when, when she said everyone needs an egg, egg donor agreement. Even if it's anonymous, whether it's known, we all need that. Um, it's how we keep people safe and how we keep people informed. Maybe it was 10 years ago. Maybe it wasn't a couple years ago. I mean, everything seems like yesterday. Um, but for me, and the reason a lawyer is important in this conversation is for two reasons. It is important that for me, that every young woman, because I only work with egg donors and I, I don't want to speak to sperm donation because I just don't know. Um, but that every young woman, every young person, um, every, I'm going to rewind that, every person with ovaries who donates, um, that they have the opportunity to um, not only speak with a lawyer, but to be able to craft an agreement that makes sense for them and that honors how they are wishing to participate as a donor and that every intended parent we work with has that same piece. And as you are speaking to fertility clinics, intended parents who are listening, that's important um, because taking care of your egg donor and ensuring she is protected is ensuring that your child is cared for in the future. By ensuring that this medical information can be passed on ensures that your child has access to medical information, which we know is a human right. Um, Cindy is great. She's going to introduce herself. She's going to talk all about her legal and personal piece of this story. Thank you. That was a really lovely introduction. Um, just to clarify, because I am a lawyer, I didn't really actually punch you in the face, right? Right. No. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, um, Coming at the end of this is um, kind of sad, I'm sorry, because the law part is so boring, although it's important. So before I get into that, and because we're almost near the end, I just want to very quickly say that um, I was a criminal defense lawyer for 30 years when I began my making a family at the old age of 42 and learned that I couldn't. I, my eggs were no good, so I needed a donor, and it was Jan who pulled me out of the black hole that I went into that she spoke about that is so typical. And, and my friends, I had a lot of wonderful friends to support me. And um, my husband, you know, was incredibly supportive and on the same page throughout all of this. But what I really noticed is that he, like I found out later so common with, with uh, partners was so the rock for me and didn't cry with me and wouldn't show the emotion. And I actually needed that. And I ran a lot of support groups later on in life where we talked about that. So when I finally came around, I had some decisions to make known versus anonymous, which is what this is about. And as the others spoke about, particularly Jan, for me as a woman, um, there was this mixed feeling of, wow, the science and the law is phenomenal. I can do this. I don't have to be without a child. I went through the adoption process. It was horrendous. Um, there are no babies, thank goodness. There's no more stigmatism for women to have a baby on their own at a young age. They are supported by the government in Canada, and that's wonderful. But there are fewer babies. And international adoption was extremely difficult. The older you are, the older the child must be, fewer, fewer in countries were allowing it. Um, so it was a very impossible process. And so this seemed to be the only way and the best way for us. And it would have my husband's genetic material, this baby, the sperm. So it would be our, I felt our child and I didn't understand the other feelings yet that we've heard about. But I was also at the same time incredibly angry and resentful of this potential woman who was making the child with my husband. So I had guilt about these mixed feelings. So I wanted her to be anonymous. My brain understood this was happening in a lab in a dish. My heart felt that my husband and this woman were going to achieve motel to have sex. 
and it was silly. Um, so we had the donation and I used all the embryos to try to get pregnant. I couldn't get pregnant. They said, try surrogacy. We went back to our anonymous donor to see if she would do it again. And when she said she would, that's when I slapped myself silly, pulled up my socks and said, you need to thank her in person. And she became known, which was something she always wanted. And that turned out to be the very best decision I ever made for myself and for my two children. And so I have a 13 year old and a 10 and a half year old. And a few years ago, my oldest started asking questions about puberty. When will this happen to me? And I could message my donor and she came over the next day for tea and they had a beautiful chat. And rather than feeling scared and, and resentful, I patted myself on the back and said, I'm a great parent. I just gave my daughter the gift of her missing identity. So that's how I did it. And as Jan said, tell the baby when they come home. I did that. I held Etta in my arms and said all those things Jan said. And I thought I was semi crazy talking to a 24 hour baby, but I did it every day. And I didn't do it constantly. I wasn't a mad woman, but I, it was a natural thing to say, I'm so lucky to have you. Nothing worked in mommy's body and these people made you and they're so wonderful. And even if the relationship isn't good, and even if you find out later your donor, your surrogate isn't the best person, what they gave you is the ultimate gift, even if there are some limitations in their personalities or lifestyles. They still gave us this gift of parenthood. And this is no different I've learned in my career between a woman and a man. The gift of parenthood is the same for everyone all over the world. So it was much easier, I will say, when I had the second baby, because then we had a two-year-old who we schlepped to the clinic appointments and met the surrogate, and it was easy for her to play with our surrogate's child and say, you know, she's going to carry your, your brother or sister, and she watched the surrogate's tummy grow, and, um, you know, she got it more um, as she got older. But I brought the next baby home and did the same thing. And so they both know, and they're probably the most famous donor conceived children baby all over the world now because everyone like you all know. So that's the personal story that led to me changing careers because I wanted to share in the fertility industry. I wanted it to change legally, politically, and I wanted it to be more open so there would be no secrecy. Selfishly, so that my two girls at Engineel would be normal would feel normal, would feel part of a world that said, who cares what color my mother's eyes or my father's eyes are? Who cares Blood type. Conceived? Yeah, absolutely. So, so I'm asking you the legal questions. Yeah, and I'm examining really. you. Yes, no, only. Really quick okay. answers. Yeah. We got left. Okay. Uh, questions that have come in. Um, what, if I have a known donor or an anonymous donor, does it change my legal contract? Absolutely no. So no, no legal difference. The law in virtually every province of Canada is actually written and where it's not actually in the statute at this time, it is understood to be the case through judge enforcement. A donor has no legal rights to the parentage to the child by virtue only of being a donor. Of course, the sperm donor is the intended parent or the egg donor in the other family is an intended parent they intend to be parents, but your third party donor, none. So there's no fear. People have talked about the myth of 18. This is an old myth from a time when the law didn't say she or he had, the donor had no rights. So you worried for the child to grow up to be 18 so that nobody was looking for child support. This is no longer an issue. This should not be seen in contracts in my view. There should be nothing about d disclosure at 18 as a parent, it's going to be, it should be your decision when your child knows when they want to reach out to the donors, as long as, of course, it's a mutual decision. When you think your children are mature enough to handle it, it's the same decision you're going to make about whether you're going to feed them peanut butter or take soy butter to school where it's allowed, or what, you know, whether they're having one religion or another or music lessons or whatever. It's okay. your decision as a parent. Ne next question. 
what do you see as um, the limitation of an anonymous versus open ID versus known donor agreement? If you see limitations or if they're pretty much the same, just missing the name, the actual name of people. That is essentially it. So even when we are working with an agency, so we call this the third party process, it's not your sister or best friend, um, there's an arm's length distance of knowledge. We have the names, but we always have a clause that respects people's privacy. Privacy versus secrecy is paramount here. Privacy means just because you know each other, you shouldn't be phoning each other all the time and you don't hang out in front of each other's homes and stalking. And we've learned over the years from experience, it's rarely a donor who would ever do that. And it's more usually the intended parents who want to watch the donor. And, you know, I wanted to do that too, you know, truth be told, but we, we have to not do that. And so my donor and I always had a respectful agreement, which was we let each other know. And she doesn't come here for dinner every week. And in 13 years, she's seen my children in person visiting four times but she and I text more frequently. Every Mother's Day, I send her a text saying thank you. Excellent, excellent. Um, Cindy, any advice that you would have from a purely, purely legal perspective for people who are um, deciding on how to build their family through uh, egg or sperm donation? I really believe that getting legal advice for all parties at the very beginning is critical not because it's paying my mortgage. The cost of an egg donor contract for the lawyers is very small. It may be a lot to people going through the process because it's expensive, but it is small in terms of what you're doing and huge for your satisfaction, your safety, security, and that of the children and the donor, as you said earlier. So the donor is being asked to sign a whole bunch of documents at a clinic called consents that are legally mandated, that's in the law. Most donors who I speak to after they've read them and signed them can't even remember doing it, let alone what was in them. Intended parents have to sign similar ones. And I, as a lawyer, didn't even understand what was in there. And I read them now and it's, I still sometimes go, why are we saying this? So how do you give consent, which means fully informed legally, if you haven't got a clue what you just read? and you're very young donors are generally in their early 20s and you know it's too much there should be legal advice at the outset and the intended parent should understand because the cons the number one question is how do i get to be sure i'm the parent and in many countries you're not so it's culturally it's what you grew up thinking and then we also want to tell you about birth registration if you're carrying your own baby donor conceived you're registering as the mother, you know, that's not an issue. If you're using a surrogate, you're still going to be considered the intended parents. In Canada and some provinces, the surrogate will be, but not the donor. And then the judge will change that. So it's never the donor. And judges have asked me to tell my colleagues who put in affidavits from donors in their surrogacy court order applications to stop doing it. They don't want I use it as part of the history, donor, surrogate. So which really relates back to secrecy and privacy. I believe those court files should be sealed because they do tell a story of a donor conceived child and it is the child's and the parent's decision to share it. It is not for the public. And I believe courts should mandate secrecy unless the parents agree and the donor but it should be the child's right and the parent's right to share it. Excellent. And I think legal advice is incredibly important. And if I know it is pretty late, but if anyone has questions for me, you know, it's Hope Springs Fertility. We're always happy to, to answer questions and donors should make sure they get thorough advice from the lawyer. I know it's a hard thing and it can feel like a burden, but it's your obligation to yourself to know what you're doing and to feel comfortable. Absolutely, absolutely. And as a donor who's donated, known anonymously with contracts, without contracts, um, and now my kids are donating because I'm just that old, you know, it's 
we talk about it all the time, how important it is to know that, you know, the intentions of everyone are written down and that, um, that everyone understands what their roles and responsibilities are in, in this family building process. And, um, I'm going to bring everyone on to thank them. Um, and Melissa, Jan, Cindy, um, I'm really hoping that we can begin, that this is the beginning of a dialogue and that we can continue to um, educate and empower people as they make decisions around building their families or participating as donors. And that we can all, um, I know that we all sort of come from different perspectives, but I know that we all fundamentally agree that um, the children, the people um, that come from uh, this work and come from donors um, deserve as a, as a basic human right to have access to their medical information and to know um, on, on, on the, the le- I don't want to say the basic level, but to know that, that this is a part of their story and um, that our children as donors also know that this is a part of their family story. And, you know, we are all interconnected. And um, so thank you everyone um, for joining us. We're gonna send out, if you're watching this live or recorded, we're gonna send out links to all of our um, programs. um, And as well, you'll likely receive an email from Cindy, an email from Melissa, maybe an email from Jan, um, an email from us, you know, as well, providing you our contact details because we do wanna connect with you and we really want to offer our support and our love as you go through this um, process. Um, And Nikki, post your agency. I don't see your agency there. Please post it so we can share another agency who who supports open donations as, as we do because it is just so, so important. So thank you everyone. And we will hopefully do this. Thank you. And thank you Leah for being, for egg helpers and for being willing to walk this really, really important route. We're so grateful to have you at the moment. Jan, you. (laughs) I don't know what I'd be today without you. (laughs) Thank you, everybody. Oh, I hope sorry, go ahead, Melissa. I hope that if there are some industry professionals on here that they take notice. We get questions all the time from parents asking, where can we do known donation? We hear you, we know it's important, we believe you, we're listening. Where can we do it? And they cannot find, <laughs> they cannot find clinics in the U.S. to do known donation. And so I'm waiting for just the business side of it for somebody to say, "Oh, this this makes business sense for us to meet this need that parents have for a known donation." You know, that would benefit us all if we could help make that happen. So. Um, I'm interested. I mean, it, I, it's funny because this is egg donation, but I uh, obviously it's necessary for both gametes to have known donation as an option, and it's very hard to find in the U.S. So, yeah, my experience with many clinics is that they're very negative against it, and I really w- wish it would change because yeah. it doesn't cost any more from the medical perspective. It's the same process. It's well, of their business. Found in countries that are doing known donation, it does not reduce the number of donors. They actually feel better knowing how many mm-hmm. people will be created and who they are, and they can tell their own children, here's who yeah. the siblings are. Well, hopefully, so- more and more countries that are uh, making laws accepting these children as citizens are saying that if there's a donor conceived child in this process, they should have the right to have this knowledge. Um, so it's important to to know where our international clients are coming from. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so thank you everyone. And uh, yeah, please reach out. Um, oh, Carol, yeah, oh, you're there. amazing. <laughs> We've got all kinds of people on this. That's fantastic, fantastic. I, I hope everyone yeah, enjoyed it. Please give us your there. feedback. Send us the questions you'd like us to cover because I'm hoping this can become an ongoing, ongoing thing for sure. So thank and you. We're going to replay this all the time on our. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. We'll talk to you all soon. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much.